So first, I just want to welcome everybody here today and say thank you very much for joining us. This is going to be our first speaker in our speaker series, Monish Kabrai. He's going to be speaking to us today. Our next speaker at the end of the month will be Joe De La Rosa on the 31st format today. Uh, we'll start off with just a few kind of preset questions to go through uh, with Monish, and then we're going to open it up to the audience to let you guys ask questions. So first, we'll kind of jump right in. Uh, Monish Pabrai has been running the Pabrai Investments since about 1999 and has had some excellent returns. You've also written several books and articles. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll just jump right in. Would you mind telling us a little bit kind of what made you decide to get into running your own investment fund and kind of how it's evolved over time? Sure. Well, Clayton, pleasure to be here and uh, wonderful to interact with the Georgetown students. That's great. You guys, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful school in a wonderful location. Well, I think Pabrai Funds actually started, uh, you could say, accidentally. And it really started as a hobby. So I heard about Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and Ben Graham around 1994. And I was... Uh, really quite taken with their approach to investing. And I had been applying their methods for about five years uh, with some good success. And I had a few friends, I used to give them stock tips here and there. They approached me in early 99 and they said that this stock tip business is very random. You know, Sometimes you tell us to buy something and we don't see you for a while. And then we don't know whether we should hold or sell or what we should do. And uh, so we'd like to systematize that. So they proposed that they would collectively give me about a million dollars, about $100,000 each. And they wanted me to manage that. And I thought of that really as a hobby because on $1 million, you're not going to make the rent payment. And uh, But I also wanted to make sure that my friends did not have any kind of a negative experience. With this, so I set up a partnership and I cloned the the rules of the Buffett partnerships in the 1950s, like no management fees, a six percent hurdle, and so on, and you know redemptions once a year, and so on. So Pabrai Fund started in July '99 with one million dollars from eight of my friends, and I put in a hundred thousand as well. And uh, I would say about 15 months after that. In uh, late 2000, I thought that I was really enjoying this running the fund, etc. By then, the assets were about two and a half million. We had had a big run up. Uh, I think we were up 70% the first year. And so at that point, I decided that I should really treat it like a real business and bring in more investors and assets and so on. And so then after that, the funds gradually scaled. And then they got up to uh, several hundred million. So that's how it got going. Okay. And has the, what's your fund objective, the way that you're looking at stocks changed over the last five, 10 years compared to those first 10 years? Yeah. I mean, I think that in this business, you need to be a continuous learning business machine. And I think the, the one thing with the investing is that all knowledge is cumulative. So unlike, you know, being a, you know, basketball player or, or a football player, as you pile on the years, you should be getting better. And such, that's wonderful. And you can keep getting better into your 70s or 80s and such, which is also great. So, yeah, I mean, the, you know, as I get more experience, and I'm able to uh, learn from especially the mistakes and also from other investors, the model changes uh, uh, periodically. I made a significant uh, change last year in the way I run the funds. And uh, the big driver of that was that when I read the full set of letters by Nick Sleep, he's the guy who used to run the Nomad Investment Partnership in London. And those letters, I think, are floating around on the internet now. So if you just you know, Google Nick Sleep Nomad letters, I think you can get the full set. And I highly recommend them. 
Nick had done really well. And I think him and his partner, Zach, over the years got some very good insights. And when I looked at their model and what they were doing, I felt that it was vastly better than the approach I was taking. And their model is really looking at these ownership stakes in businesses really as if you were the founder or the manager of the business. And to think about it in the way the founding family would think about it. And so that basically stretches out time horizons. It also changes the type of businesses you invest in. And uh, it's very tax efficient. And actually, I think more satisfying. Okay, no, that's very interesting. Did that change with the way that you're valuing companies because of the pandemic? Or just um, just- I think, the, no, it doesn't so much change how you value businesses. I think the, the difference is that instead of buying a, a business that is undervalued, maybe you know 50% off or 60% off from what its intrinsic value is, you focus more on long-term compounders and businesses that can grow and scale over time. So instead of just buying what, what I had done for a long time, which is discounted pies, the focus changes to growing pies. And uh, growing pies, you may have to sometimes pay a bit, bit more for them because usually they recognize as better businesses. But uh, in many cases, the end result is a lot better. Okay. All right. So Georgetown is very international focused, and we had a lot of students that really wanted to hear um, kind of your thoughts on investing in multiple countries. Uh, I know that's something that you have a lot of experience in. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think one of the issues I was facing in the last few years is I was finding it difficult to find businesses to invest in the United States. Things are and uh, we may now be entering a period of un-euphoria, which is fine, but things seem to be priced to perfection or even overpriced, et cetera, in the case of uh, some good businesses and some not so good businesses. And uh, so I wanted to broaden out uh, what I was looking at. And I could tell that there were some countries where just the entire market was cheap. And these were places that people were not interested in investing in equities, things like places like Japan, Korea, Turkey, and so on. And uh, over the years, you know, I've had interaction with investors and fund managers all over the world And for example, I have a good friend in Seoul who's a very good fund manager. He's very well trained in the methods of Buffett, Munger, and Graham. And so naturally, if I were to look at the things that he's investing in, many of those seem to be of interest to me. So I I asked him if I could uh, visit Seoul and if we could just go and visit all the companies in his portfolio. And uh, he, he said, oh, that would be such a blast. So I made a few trips in the last few years to Korea. Usually they're week-long trips and they usually end up seeing about 15 or 20 businesses. And they have been um, incredible learning opportunities. And because I, I had a, a trusted friend who knew the, the landscape, And in, you know, I think, uh, like, for example, in in this case, I was looking at, uh, you know, whether I should clone things that they have done. Cloning is a very powerful model because it's already been through one set of filters and uh, and such. And similarly, in Turkey, there's a a very good friend of mine who is a, a smart investor. He's more grand than Munger, and I'm trying to transition him from Graham to Munger. It's the same in Korea. There, Because these markets are so cheap, it, it becomes very tempting to just look at, you know, things that are trading at three times earnings and such and not really focus on the better businesses that may be at eight or nine times earnings. So these last few years, I made several trips in uh, 
in these countries and I met uh, dozens of businesses and we've, uh, we've got investments in Turkey and in Korea now and we like those investments. And uh, so that's, uh, that's been helpful. I was going to go last year to China, but then that trip got canceled because of COVID. And uh, so that's uh, hopefully once we get past all the lockdowns and such, then uh, uh, that'll be one of my first trips as well to China, uh, related to specifically looking at businesses and such. Okay. And is there anything that changes whenever you're evaluating it from one country to the next? Well, I think you have to, uh, yeah, there, there are some cultural nuances I think you should be sensitive to. I think uh, it's helpful to understand uh, how the managers and owners uh, think about these businesses. And it's important to understand the cultural aspects of uh, some of these some of these countries as an overlay on top of the business analysis. But for the most part, it's not that uh, that different, you know. A business is a business, and you know we want to look at the future cash flows, and then we want to discount those back. So most of those things are pretty standard across the board. All right. And would you mind walking us through maybe some of your thoughts on some past investments, either what made you decide to get in or get out of them? Well, there's a large list of past investments. Would you like losers or winners? I guess the one that you think is the most interesting. Well, I think the the best lessons come from the losers. We don't really learn much from the winners. We do make some money and uh, we pat ourselves on the back. So I think the uh, when we lose money, that those lessons uh, get seared in. And uh, I had created a checklist uh, maybe around uh, 13 years ago. And it's a pre-investment checklist. And it goes through evolution over time. We keep adding more questions. But what I found in that checklist is that the, and it was created looking at all the mistakes great investors have made, where there was enough data before the investment was made that should have given the investor some pause, but they went ahead anyway. So there was something that was visible as a chink in the armor, if you will. and. Uh, so what I found is that I looked at these investments that these great investors made and they didn't work out. They fell into about four or five categories. The largest category, the one with the biggest number of mistakes, was related to leverage. So leverage was a big part of why investments didn't work out. Another big part was misunderstanding of the moat and the competitive advantage. So somehow not, not fully grasping the realities of the moat or the lack thereof. And then the third big piece was, uh, piece was management and ownership, just kind of uh, issues related to them. I have had a lot of difficulty over the last couple of decades with companies with leverage. And I've had multiple zeros, which is a 100% loss of the invested capital because of leverage. And uh, so I'm a lot more leery about going into situations where there's a great amount of debt, uh, though we do have in businesses in our portfolio currently which have significant debt, but uh, there was a lot of work I did on making sure it was ring fenced and it couldn't really hurt you, if you will. So a big one was in, I think, in 2008, 2007, late 2007, the financial crisis, uh, we owned a mortgage company, Delta Financial. And uh, Delta Financial basically used to, they were actually a sensible underwriter of mortgages. But so they would they would uh, issue a bunch of mortgages. They had these warehouse lines of credit. And then they would package those, securitize those, and get those off their balance sheet, make their money, and then go buy some more. So that was their business, which is, you know, uh, write the mortgages and uh, put them on the warehouse lines and then bundle them and sell them to investors and then release the money and keep going. And it was a very profitable business because it didn't need much equity and so on. But they got caught with a significant amount of mortgages on their warehouse lines and the music stopped on the securitizations. 
so they couldn't they couldn't get them out and then they started tripping covenants and eventually uh with these housing prices started declining and such it eventually took them out they went back and we had a pretty significant loss i think we had around 50 60 million that we lost on delta financial so that's an example of you know we're not going to be doing any mortgage companies in the near future we haven't done any since then either so that that's quite understandable and you mentioned a minute ago uh, looking for competitive advantages and looking for compounders what are your thoughts on looking for that competitive advantage in businesses well usually it will show up in the numbers so if the business has a strong moat and strong advantages then you will see over a long period of time it showing up in the revenue and the growth and the cash flows uh, you know like if you look at a company like mastercard you can just look at numbers and see that it's a great business and uh, so moats generally will make themselves quite visible most of the time and so i think it's not that hard to sift through businesses and se- separate them into which ones are great and which ones are not so great the issue that comes in is that usually the businesses that are great are usually well recognized as such and are usually trading at either full price or overpriced and uh, so it's a combination of finding a great business and maybe either misunderstood or facing some temporary headwinds which has um decimated the price and then that in that circumstance you could step in and uh, do quite well okay well thank you for that so we're about to turn it over to let the audience ask questions but before we do that do you want to say anything about your your foundation that you've started well uh yeah so uh, uh my wife and i had started the dakshina foundation in 2006 it was becoming clear around then uh, 2006 2007 that we would end up with significantly more assets than we could consume in our lifetime and uh, so when you find yourself in that circumstance there are really only two things you can do you could either give it to your gene pool or you could in some way recycle it back to society and um giving it to your gene pool you know i think uh buffett has a quote he's saying if you're jesse owens son you're not really going to become a great sprinter by starting at the 40 meter line you know when everyone's starting at the 0 meter line if you start at the 40 meter line that's not going to make you into a great sprinter and so a uh, large inheritance is actually are a disservice to the future members of your gene pool because you know the fun for us was making it you know figuring it out and having a productive life if you are on a iv drip throughout your life you know that probably is just like having an iv drip in the hospital you know doesn't sound so interesting so i think uh, basically if you eliminate the prob- possibilities of just giving it to your gene pool and it's okay to give something to your gene pool like i think you could put jesse owens son at the 5 meter line not the 40 meter line that's probably okay uh, then the only choice left is to uh, give it back to society and what i wanted to do so i knew we were going to recycle back i wanted to do it similar to the way we do investing which is look for high social return on invested capital and uh, so i didn't want to just have you know some building named after me or something uh, that has no appeal to me but uh, i wanted to see if these uh, resources could be used in a efficient way for the benefit of society and actually it's worked out really well dakshina basically helps very poor underprivileged kids who are very bright in india and we prep them and get them accepted at the top elite schools in india and these elite schools in india are pretty cheap to attend but they're very hard to get into so the prep is very expensive and so 
because we provide the prep for free, it's a leveler. It, it takes away the advantage the rich or upper middle class kids have. And it's worked out really well. We've, we've had uh, several thousand kids uh, get into the IITs and the top medical schools and so on. And so it's been really satisfying and it's uh, done far better than uh, I would have thought. So it's worked out great. Well, good, good. That's great to hear. And it looks like Chris has his hand up. Thank you very much, uh, Manish and uh, Clayton. Great job for uh, organizing this, and, th and thank you all for, for coming. Manish, so um, as uh, part of our, our graduate investment fund, uh, you know, we invest, we're a long equity fund, uh, and we invest in uh, just different public securities, essentially. And we're benchmarked to the MSCI ACWI uh, All Country World Index as our, as our benchmark index. Um, we want to share, so we know your specialty, as you, you were mentioning, is, is value investing. So our portfolio uh, over the last several years has been uh, actually traditionally more high growth stocks that, that have performed quite well in the tech space, uh, particularly. Our uh, forward PE is about 23 for our entire portfolio versus MSCI Acqui, which is around 18, which has done well uh, over the last two years. But this year, it's starting to hurt us, as we see, you know, with with the, the yield curve increasing and steepening, you know, that's hurting uh, some of the very expensive names in our portfolio. And we're looking to add more value and kind of uh, would love to get your, your opinion and advice as to some things we should be looking at to, to incorporate more value uh, for, for the market trends this year. Well, I mean, I think that uh, I wouldn't look at the trends and I also wouldn't uh, be particularly concerned about forward PE of 23 versus market at 18 or whatever. I think that the PE is a, you know, it's an inadequate metric to uh, help us too much. So I think what really uh, matters is the businesses that you own in the portfolio, what are their prospects in the next five or 10 years? And what, what kind of revenues and cash flow you generate over that period? And so if they, are growing at, you know, if you're paying 23 times forward earnings, but if these businesses are growing at 20, 30% a year, and that growth would continue for, you know, five or 10 years, those are not expensive businesses. And I would ignore whatever noise there is with temporary, you know, drawdowns and so on. And uh, so I think it's, it's really a matter of, I, I never focus on what is happening in markets and uh, you know, macro events and all of that. I, I think at the end of the day, what matters is how does a particular business do over a long period of time? And so I think that one of the things I learned last year from Nick Sleep, uh, so, you know, Nick Sleep said that, you know, uh, Walmart went public in 1970 and it's now 51 years. And the only investors who have held the stock for 51 years is the Walton family. And other investors did not hold it for 50 years or 40 years or even 30 years. And Nick Sleep makes the point that for a large portion of Walmart's history, like in the 70s and maybe even into the 80s, you could have paid 100 times earnings for Walmart and you would have still had a home run and you would have still beaten the market. Uh, so Walmart is a business that has shown us that the post public runway, uh, because they were all private before that, which they also did well on, but just as a public company, that runway has lasted for over half a century and it doesn't look like it's running out of steam anytime soon. They're still cranking. I think the important thing in investing is, can I tell what a business looks like five years or 10 years from now? What are their cash flows likely to be? And I think the important thing that I learned from Nick Sleep is if you find yourself in the position of having ownership in a great business, which has great growth prospects for a long time, the best thing to do is do nothing. Just, and we might have drawdowns and different things going on uh, because, you know, when the index goes down, everything goes down. But what we should focus on is the underlying business value. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And let's hear, Jesus, you wanna ask your question? 
Yes, thank you very much, Moniz. I am a long time ago follower of you, Guy Spear. Um, I was in Omaha two, two years ago, but I didn't see you. And I have a couple of questions, but I just limit to one. What advice would you give to us as younger investors in case we wanted to start our own investment vehicles? You have been advocated a lot for the 0625 structure fee, but I don't see that it's feasible, at least uh, in the, at the beginning. And um, which advice would you give to us uh, to, if we want to start with our own thing, with our, our own vehicle? So oh, I'm sorry, I, you, you said it's not feasible at the beginning? I don't know. That's my question. Yeah, so I think that, uh, yeah, so I would recommend the 0625 structure. And I would recommend that structure right from the beginning. You know, if I were to maybe tell the story of Lee Lu, who is a money manager for Charlie Munger, Munger gave him money to manage because Lee Lu came as a penniless student from China, you know, studying at Columbia on student loans. And there was a float between the time he got the loan and the time the money was spent or the tuition was paid. And in that float period, he invested the money. And by the time he graduated, he had over a million dollars just from the float of the student loans. And then he uh, continued to invest and his net worth continued to go up. So Charlie Munger's perspective is that if he were going to give a money manager money to manage, the first basic criteria he would look for is, is the guy financially independent? Because if you are a gifted money manager, even if you start with small sums and you're beating the market by some healthy margin, probably by the time you're 35 or 40, uh, you should be independently wealthy. And if that is not the case, then Charlie would say, well, you don't deserve to get money from him to be, ma to be managing. So the, the first question I would ask any money manager is, what has been your wealth accumulation with your own money before you're looking for other people to give you money to manage? In my, in my case, for example, I had sold a portion of my business for about a million dollars in 94. And I think by 1999, I wasn't even asking people to give me money. They had come to request me to take their money. By 1990, that, that was north of 10 million. So in about five years, it had gone up more than 10x. And Buffett says that if you are a manager who has delivered and maybe in the future is likely to deliver significantly above market returns, then you could be a leper on a rowboat in the middle of the Atlantic and they will swim through shark infested waters to give you money to manage. So there's nothing you need to do other than, you know, do your work and they will find, they will find you, trust me. Uh, and they will want to put money to manage with you. So if someone is start, starting a fund, my advice to them would be number one, I would say, what have you done in the past for yourself? And because that is, I think, the basic proof that you are a, a good manager is if you have actually accumulated some wealth. If that is true that you have accumulated some wealth, I think then the second piece becomes relatively easy. People will look at that and be interested in giving you money to manage. But if that is not the case, then you focus on friends, family, and fools. And amongst the three, the fools are the most important. So I would go with the 0625, and the 0625 should not be a problem if you are independently wealthy. And uh, it gives you a competitive advantage because a lot of my investors will not put money with managers who charge, you know, one or 2% management fees because they like that 
alignment of interests. So that, that's what I would recommend. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And Hiten, uh, if you want to go next, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Hi, Monish. Um, I wanted to ask, during your first couple of years running for Pride Funds, you had, I imagine, investors who thought a lot like you or who believed in your uh, frame of uh, investing. How about the next 10 to 20 years? How did you find, um, you know, a choir that sang to your tune? I'm sorry, uh, can you just repeat that? So the first two yeah. years? So, so the first couple of years, your first early investors in Pride Funds, they, the investors probably thought a lot like you and believed in your value investing framework. Yeah. How did you get more investors who thought in the same way? Uh, what well, the, I, that I, journey? Yeah, I think I think that's relatively straightforward. So, if you are if you own a McDonald's and you put a sign of McDonald's outside, and when you go in this restaurant, you serve fine French food, you're going to have a very confused customer base who may not come back because it is, they wouldn't understand what's going on. And if you have a fine French restaurant and inside is you're serving McDonald's hamburgers, your customers will again get confused. So I would say that what my experience has been is that the behavior and the way you interact with the investors will drive who comes to the restaurant. And what ends up happening is that if, if you have the right kind of, you know, rules and behavior, you will naturally attract the right kind of investor. So I am a weird guy. If you got to know me better, you would know that I'm quite weird. So one of the things I decided when I was independently wealthy is I just want to do things my way, you know. What's the point of being independently wealthy if you can't do things your way? So I don't like a lot of human contact. Generally, human contact is not that exciting. And I don't like to have a lot of conversations with potential investors or even current investors, etc. I just like to be in a room by myself. That's quite exciting for me. So I set up some rules. Okay, my rules were, if you wanted to invest in Pabrai funds, I was not available to talk to you and I wasn't available to really interact with you. There was a lot of information on our website. You could read that. And if you were excited about what you read, we could send you subscription documents and you could join the funds. And if you wanted to meet the fund manager or have conversations or have a quarterly call or any of those things, well, that just wasn't going to happen. So I opened a McDonald's. I put up a sign which said McDonald's. And when you went in, there were just great Big Macs that you could have. So what happened is that under these rules, under these weird rules, certain things happened. And I, I actually... Uh, I can only say that because now I have the experience of seeing who walked into the McDonald's. I've seen for 20 years who walked in and who just looked at the sign and the rules and just walked on, right? So the people who walked into the restaurant were almost all principals. They were almost no agents, right? So first of all, when people are coming to invest, there's the people who have their own money, and they're the agents who are, so for example, a university endowment, it's run by agents. It's not their money. And so when a university endowment would look at the rifles, they would call and say, can we have a conversation? You know, we have N billion under management. And my assistant would just give them the website link and ID and password and say, well, what would it And very quickly they would move on because they're not getting what they need, right? And so, so what ended up happening is because of, so the way you set up your rules and what you put on the outside of this restaurant, the signage is important. I ended up with an investor base, which is principals. It's their own money. 
And the second uh, aspect of the demographic I have is most of them are first generation entrepreneurs. So most of them are not, you know, third generation wealth coming down. These are individuals who basically, for the most part, created their own business, created some wealth. And the other thing, because I was not willing to have conversations, these were people who were willing to do research on their own. So they were willing to go into a website, look at it. I mean, I have investors in New Zealand who I have never met. We have never had a phone call. And they wired several million dollars to us after going to our website. The good news is I'm not a fraud. And that money is actually there and everything's fine. No problem. And to my investors in New Zealand, thank you very much. I I love having you. And uh, we have an annual meeting once a year and uh, people show up. People show up from all over the world for the annual meeting. It's great. And uh, usually I'm meeting uh, some of the investors for the first time. There are lots and lots of investors I have, uh, lots of families I have that I have never met. And I have never had a phone call. But I still love them. I want to let them know that I do love them. So I think that whatever rules you set up and whatever your signage is, is going to naturally drive who enters your funds. And I really like the cast of characters. Uh, we have around like, you know, I don't know, 350 or 400 families in Pabrai funds. I love these guys. I love these families. They're wonderful. And uh, I'm happy that we've been able to do something. So it's worked out very well. And David, if you'd like to go. Hi, and thank you again so much for meeting with us, particularly given how exclusive it is to be able to meet with you. I feel very much more lucky to be able to meet with you. And you must have one of the best websites in the whole wide world. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> My question, though, is more about stock picking. The, the way that our club operates is we have sector heads and the sector heads have their analysts who help them, who support them. And then after they come up with an idea for a stock, that idea is pitched to the club and we vote on it. And a majority through a majority vote, it goes into the fund. My question, though, is there is a universe with hundreds of thousands of publicly traded securities out there. What suggestions would you have for young people like us to just put our finger up there and say, this is a good area uh, to invest in, or this is a good stock to invest in? How do you sort of get your head around that universe of publicly traded securities available? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think the first thing is that you don't need to have an opinion on most of these securities. In fact, I would say you don't need to have an opinion on 99% of them. So the first thing I would do is try to figure out what are the parts of the world that I understand? What's my circle of competence? Do I understand, you know, the banking sector really well? Or do I understand Apple really well? What do I understand really? If you understand something really well, by definition, you would know what that business is worth. And then then you know what it's worth and you know what it's being priced at. And you can see whether there's a delta between the two. So I would not focus on, you know, looking at this whole great big wide world. I would just look at, you know, things that you know about, things that you understand, products that you use, just things around you that make sense. You read the newspaper. Something intrigues you about something, and you you dive in and dig in and uh, and then take it from there. So that's how I would go about it. I would not really try to complicate it more than that. And, and as a follow up, after you've identified a company that you think is interesting, how do you decide if it's worth pulling the trigger and executing on that particular company? Well, I think it should get to a point where you should be able to explain to a nine-year-old in about five sentences why you're going to be drowning in wealth after investing in that business and why there's no chance you would lose any money. And so if you can explain to an eight or nine-year-old in a paragraph or less, 
then I think you got it. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you. And Jesus, uh, you had another question? Yeah, if I may, uh, and we have time. Uh, I, I see it as so COVID this year has changed uh, a lot of things, the way we do, the way we buy, the way we interact with other people, we connect, we do business. One of the things that are really struggling is the how we purchase things, no? And it, it surprised me that uh, it appears that you opened recently a position in certain growth properties, specializing commercial property. What are you seeing there that other investors don't see? I see other investors running away from commercial retail uh, rate and commercial uh, properties, and you are going into that sector. Is there anything else despite the price? Well, I'll mostly duck your question, but I would say this, that the stock market is like a theater. And in the theater, the rule is that every seat has to be occupied. Or in other words, if there is a business and it has 10 million shares outstanding, every one of those shares has to be owned by somebody. There's no shares just sitting there with nobody. So the seats in the theater are fully occupied and they always have to be fully occupied. And now there's a fire in the theater or someone yells fire. So when you hear the word fire, you want to just get up from your seat and go to the exit. You don't want to really ask any questions, whether there's a real fire or a fake fire. You just say, I am out of here. But there's a rule in this theater, which is different from the other theaters, that you can only leave your seat if you find somebody else to take your seat. Because that share has to be held by someone. Right? So it's not like you can just leave the theater and the seat will be empty. No. The rule is you can leave the theater, but you need to find somebody outside who will come and sit inside the theater. And so, you know, you go outside the theater and say, listen, it's okay. The movie is great. There's a little bit of fire and there's some smoke, but it, don't really worry about it. It's really probably nothing. But I'm giving you my ticket, which cost me $10. Please, you can have it for 50 cents. Do you want to take it? And the guy says, you know, not really. He says, listen, please take it for 25 cents. Okay, so there is a clearing price for the ticket. Because you can't leave till somebody sits in your seat. And so now we will answer the question on Seritage at some point when I don't own it. Okay, sometime in the future, I will not own it. I would just say that before COVID, Seritage was trading at $35 or $40 a share. And there was suddenly a fire. And instantly the stock went to six to nine dollars a share. So that was the price at which somebody else was willing to buy that seat, me being one of them. And uh, I own uh, one eighth, little more than one eighth of all the seats in that theater. So I must like the movie. It may be a little warm under my seat, but the movie is great. Amazing answer, amazing answer. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I put you in a difficult- Oh, no, no, it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed my answer. And I hope I can give you a more richer answer in the future i will get that answer in the future yes absolutely great thank you and brendan you had a question yeah manish thank you for coming today it's we've learned a lot and i know the fun's taking a lot from this to build off the last two questions talking about feeling the fire under the seat when we take a position i'm having a personal problem with this as well as the fund could also work on this taking a position that's grown to a sizable portion of the portfolio and then 
learning when to pare back that position or even exit the trade, um, whether it's reached intrinsic value or it's just become a large part of the portfolio that's starting to adversely affect the diversification. So my question is, when do you realize you should start paring back your trade and start taking some profits in the position? Well, the Walton family hasn't done that for 51 years. And many, many founders have not done that. So the question I would ask, and this I think, I think, is, I think you would get a lot out of next sleep's letters, is the question I would ask is, is the business getting better? So I wouldn't really focus so much on the valuation. So my mindset would be that of a founder that I'm like a founder or a family that owns the business. And uh, I'm not particularly concerned that it's worth 100 and it's trading at 120. That is, I think, an irrelevant data point for me. What I'm concerned about is what is the quality of the business? And is the business getting better? Now, if the valuation is completely egregious, right? I mean, like, you know, snowflake or something, you know, this thing is trading at 80 times sales or something. Well, that's a different conversation, okay? But I wouldn't be particularly concerned if there was a good business and I think it should be worth 20 times earnings and it's trading at 30 times earnings. I, I don't think the factor there would be that it's, I can find something at you know, 12 times earnings and do that. So there's tax implications for that in most accounts. I used to be an investor who used to look at intrinsic values, sell and go back and buy something else. I think that if I own a great business, that's the question I want to ask. Is the business getting better? And if the answer is yes, and the pricing is not extremely egregious, I'm just doing nothing. Great. Thank you. Okay. And the other thing is, I think that this pairing back issue is that we should be comfortable with 95% in one stock. So if, if you made a great investment in Amazon 10 or 15 years ago, and it just grew and grew and grew, and it became like 80, 90% of the portfolio, and you look at Amazon today, is the business getting better? Absolutely. It's getting better by the day. And uh, is it egregiously overvalued? I don't think so. You know, So my answer would be if it was 95% of my portfolio, and I owned it for 15 years, I would just do nothing. You know, Jeff is telling me it's day one. It's still day one. So we'll wait till at least day two. When he says it's day two, I'll look at it. All right, great. Thank you. And Adam, you had a question? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Clayson. Um, thank you, sir, for this very interesting presentation. I was just wondering if you could uh, briefly talk a little bit more about, you, you mentioned, you alluded to correlation. And whether you had a view on what's a good number of um, stocks in a portfolio, um, you, you well, I would I would say that if you talk to Charlie, he would say that you don't need more than four or five stocks. I'd say if you were running your own money, probably that's a good answer. You know, four or five stocks is good. For Bri funds, usually I don't put more than ten percent into something. Uh, it's other people's money, you know. The guy in New Zealand, we got to take care of him. Uh, so yeah, I mean, but I don't think one should own thirty stocks or twenty stocks. I think I think you know, ten is plenty. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Isaac, you had a question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Manish, for coming to speak with us. I've uh, really enjoyed listening to this. Uh, I have a question regarding level of uh, certainty and how much information you need to know before entering a position. And if what I found is if you, or in my own personal investing is, uh, there's a certain point between, you know, getting comfortable with a position and knowing everything when I'm comfortable starting to invest and I continue doing my research. And you're never gonna get to understanding 100% of a business, but I always aim to get to a level where I'm, I'm comfortable knowing it. And I was just curious to hear your thoughts on how much uh, information you need to understand for your level of conviction to be a buy? Yeah, I think there's a couple of approaches. You know, I think what I notice with someone like Lee Lu or even with Nick Sleep is they tend to start these positions small 
And they don't seem to have a problem with buying as it goes up in price. They don't have a problem paying more. I think I think Lilu has spoken that he believes the risk factors go down as you own the business for longer because you know more about it. And, uh, and so even, even though you're paying a higher price, your amount of knowledge is just vastly superior. And the other thing I, what I found to be true is you really understand a business only after you own it. So it has to be real, you know, to be real money in a portfolio. That's when you really start to understand it. So it could be just fine. I mean, I think when uh, Nick Sleep was running his portfolio, he would have 30 stocks. But, you know, seven or eight stocks would make up 70, 80%. And then there was a farm team on the side, which is, you know, a bunch of small positions, which might move up to, you know, the major leagues at some point or might not. So you could take that approach. I haven't taken that approach in my portfolio, but I think that's a valid approach and that's fine. So you could do it a couple of different ways. Thank you. Elliot, it looks like you have a question. Oh yeah. Um, I would just want to ask you about like, so from your own standpoint, like when you conduct investing, particularly for those pers- perspective investors who want to be more active within the emerging market, especially for those type of companies with less disclosure capacity, less regulatory disclosure, and also more volatile business nature. When you go into do those deep, like a deep value investing, what are the key suggestions you will give to investors, especially right now, they may not have enough like access to those information from your own standpoint, when, what's the risk or suggestion you will give? Well, I would say that you should be willing to take a pass if you're not getting all the data you need or all the data to be comfortable. There's such a large range of businesses that you could invest in uh, that if if you're looking at a company and you don't have enough information, I mean, I think disclosures can be low in a business, but your understanding can be really good. So I don't think it's a direct correlation between disclosure and understanding. The key is, So, for example, it could be there's an emerging market business where you are a consumer of the product and you understand the product really well. And you also have a very good understanding of the economics of the business around that product. So if you understand the product and, you know, the moat and all of that, then the disclosures the company is doing is not that relevant uh, because I think you have a great and the other thing is to look at the track record. You know, it should show up in the in the historic track record. And uh, so I think that I would not want to invest. I don't invest anything until I have great conviction. And you can get great conviction even if the business is not providing a lot of detail. If you really understand it well. Uh, but if you don't get that great conviction, I think you should have the discipline to move on. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. All right. And it looks like we have time for one last question. Uh, David, do you want to go? Yeah. Hi. So I just have a, an additional question. Um, what, what, what's what been worrying you these days in the market? Um, obviously, the market has been on a tear since, since I guess, June, May. But what what, what has been worrying you lately? Uh, you know, so there's a saying, if wealth is lost, nothing is lost. If health is lost, something is lost. And if character is lost, everything is lost. I don't think I've ever been concerned about the markets or wealth or anything. So I think what is happening in the market for the most part is irrelevant. You know, even during the financial crisis, I think like uh, my portfolio was down like two thirds. And later, uh, my wife was telling me that she didn't realize that was going on because she didn't see any change in my demeanor or anything. You know, there was no change. In fact, those are good times because you get a lot of good opportunities to to do things. I, I am never really interested or focused on the market. I'm really looking at individual businesses and. Sometimes these individual goal businesses go on sale because of specific circumstances around that business, some temporary hiccups. And uh, 
sometimes they go on sale because everyone's panicked and every theater's on fire. You know, it's not just one theater on fire. It's like a hundred theaters on fire and such, you know. So then, um, uh, then those tickets really get discounted. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's too minutia to worry yourself about these things. Great. Thank you. So that wraps up our time for today. Uh, Munish, are there any last thoughts or pieces of advice you would like to share? Well, I really enjoyed the session. You know, it's always uh, when we do these sessions, it's kind of hard to tell where it goes. I think this uh, this session went well. I think we uh, covered uh, some nice ground and some good areas. It was fun for me, and I hope it was fun for you. Uh, it was absolutely fun for me. Uh, enjoy it very much, and thank you, everybody, for coming today. Thank you.